So good afternoon, folks, and thank you for tuning in to another Risk Institute online session. Today, we're fortunate to have with us our very own Mr. Vladimir Stepanov, who will be talking to us about his research in uncertainty in agent-based models. Uh, the presentation will be around 45 minutes and around 20 minutes of Q&A. So please, could you make sure that your microphone's muted? And if, you leave any, if you'd like to leave any questions in the chat or raise your hand at the end of the talk, I'll uh, select questions. And um, before we begin, I'd just like to make a few announcements. So uh, our next talk after today's is um, with Dr. Divya M. Peswad from NASA, and she'll be talking to us about 3D imagery to support, to support planetary exploration from the 25th of May, uh, which will be exciting. Then the following three talks, we haven't actually got any titles for yet, but we have Enrique, our very own, on the 31st of May at 2 p.m. We have Dr. Dalal Alvajet from Imperial College on the 6th of June. And then we also have our alumni, Dr. Sylvia Tolo on the 14th of June at 2 p.m. So just to have a little bit of context and an introduction to our speaker today, Mr. Vladimir Stepanov studied his BSc in computer science at University of Edinburgh before starting an MRes PhD program at the Risk Institute at Liverpool. In his PhD, he explores the different methods of representing epistemic uncertainty in an ABM. Uh, I'm not quite, quite sure what an ABM is, but I'm sure Vladimir will tell us. Like, I think it's agent-based modeling. Um, and yeah, so without further ado, Vladimir, would you like to start sharing your slides, please? There you go. Right. Perfect, so, you. as Francis nicely introduced me, well, I'll be like talking about. Uh, I'll start off with the, like the basic like uncertainty in agent-based models before I'll start um, talking about the epistemic uncertainty in agent-based models. And yes, Francis was right. Uh, it's agent ABM is short for agent-based models. So we'll start off with the types of uncertainty. And we all know there's two types, aleatory and epistemic uncertainty. So aleatory is, originates from the Latin word alia, which means die, uh, is like the plural of dice. And it's, it's also known sometimes as statistical uncertainty and can best be described as a um, natural variation between each experiment. So an example that is provided, I provide is like, if you have a pair of six-sided dice and we throw it, we do not know which of the faces will show, but we, on average, we can say each face will show roughly a sixth of the time. Moving on to epistemic, it originates from the Greek word for knowledge. And this focuses more on the unknown factor. It could be a variable or some fixed value, which could we could find more about it with like more insight or knowledge. So the example for this is the actual number of birds in a forest. We can sample like a small area, get a general idea, but we do not know the actual number of birds or like the actual population. And another example is if we have a, a, a throw of the dice that's already happened, but it's hidden from us, we are basically, we do not know which side of the face is up. So we are epistemically uncertain about it. So, right, an agent based, I'll now introduce like the basics of um, an agent based model. And an agent based model is used to recreate high level functionality from low level subsystems. They run simultaneously, and each agent is presumed to act in their own interest. And agents may experience learning. And by learning, I mean modifying behavior rules from experiences they have. So, here's like a nice um, that logo example of like sheep and wolves, where sheep eat grass to reproduce and wolves eat the sheep. So further on each agent, so further in from that example, the agents in that were the sheep and the wolves, and they're all bound by the limited number of actions in each time step. The model like advances with each time step. And what I mean by time step, is that each time step is usually fixed to a unit of time. So one time step can be either 10 minutes or 10 years. 
and the time steps universal to all the agents in that model. But what is an agent? An agent, as I said before, is can define its own, make its own decisions on its knowledge. And it, a lot of stuff can be an agent and it depends on how it's programmed. So some of the examples are trees in the forest. They might be competing for resources like light water, animals, the, the sheep and the wolves. And another one is fire, modeling the forest fire. So the fire is the agent and it spreads to nearby trees. So they can, you can have different levels of abstraction for what you want as an agent. So the simplest agent-based model is Conway's game of life. And the rules of it is that each cell is filled either alive or dead. Like alive is filled, empty is dead. And each cell observes its neighboring cells and updates itself according to rules. So the, here, the cell that's observing its neighboring cells is cell zero, and it's observing its eight neighbors. So if there's fewer than two lives, neighbors, it dies. If there's two to three, it lives. And there's more than three, it dies. So like overpopulation. And any dead cells with three neighbors becomes alive. So like reproduction. So there are patterns that emerge from these simple rules. And as you can see, some of them become like equilibrium, like here. And they can change. So from random, you can see that they some size stabilize and some patterns like emerge from it. There's no like in any uncertainty in this. And then introducing like a more uncertain model will be like aleatory. So for this, I've just used a random walk to show like the representation. So here's just a turtle and it moves and here's the results of it. And here's another walk. And here's another one. As you can see the difference. Well, so now we move on to modeling epistemic uncertainty. Um, one of the simplest epistemic models is modeling time. And that's mostly simple because all we all it has to happen for you to model epistemic time. This is just to increase the time step definition. The disadvantage of this, it does make the model more coarse, but it basically reduces the epistemic uncertainty. So you can carry on using the model as it was before. So the example we have is like the time step of simulation is five minutes. So simulation of five time steps is 25 minutes in like real time. If something takes from five to 10 minutes, so we're epistemically uncertain about the time, it takes to produce something or do an action. We just increase the time set to represent 10 minutes. So we encapsulate it into that so that it's only one um, action can take place again. Other types of epistemic, uh, epistemic uncertainty modeling is Monte Carlo encapsulation. And here, the Monte Carlo basically allows you to, you take the unknown variables, the epistemically unknown variables, and put them outside the ABM. And so, like, for example, here, like, the number of defects represented by an interval. So it's basically approximates with a uniform for Monte Carlo. The, we have select a value from this distribution and use that value for that model iteration. So if it's, like, from 0 to 1, is the range of the uniform distribution, we can take a value like 0 0.5 and 0 0.5 is the true value for that model, for that like simulation. And then we'll repeat, so a new value will be stacked. It could be like three quarters, a quarter or something, and it just carries on. So the problems with this is that as the number of variables increase, we need more computational power and regular Monte Carlo may start to normalize. So because they're all, there's assumptions under the distributions, they may start all start towards the center. So toward, tend towards the center due to independent Monte Carlo assumptions of independence. And as if you're 
um, was uh, modeling from intervals, you would assume they're all uniform. Can, uh, can this be potentially solved with other implementation? There are, there's lots of research in like reducing computational costs, but some of them just basically say, oh, we'll use the most significant, so there's less variables, but it doesn't really, the problem of normalizing still stays as the Monte Carlo assumes independence. Well, are there alternative ways to model? So the alternative ways is branching. One of them is branching. So for every decision, we create a new model. That's not feasible. So example, could, should there be, should I take all left or right? And if you don't know, because some decision is hidden or, or something, we can we model both and for each, we model both. So you take a both left and both right. But if there's multiple agents that are doing it, you have to model taking both the left and the right for both, for all the agents. The other way to do it is to propagate the uncertainty inside the model. So you use both outcomes in the following decisions. So like an additional field for existence. So the example is firing and not firing the missiles. So you simulate as if both actions are happening at the same time. And so both decisions are carried on through the model. So you have both have a missile and don't have a missile. So going back to branching, can it work? So if every decision is a new branch, no, we can't. But it is possible for limited actions and where there's a limited number of agents. The example for this is chess. But in the open world, it's no, it's too computationally expensive because it will branch too quickly as each branch could then have the same amount of decisions as the previous one. What about, well, if we can try and do um, proven branching, which we basically decide this is a branch where if this condition is reached, it just goes into that branch. So you only ha you have less branches so you can control the, the branching. So I, I've, I wrote a branch for each term. What I mean by term is that, well, it could be a, a variable type. So if the variable type is defects, so if you're not sure about defects, it just all goes into that one branch. So you then have the two branches of, I'm sure there's no defects on that. And the, the ones is, I'm not sure there's any defects. So this is better, but still not ideal. As you can see, it still grows quite, as more times are introduced, still grows quite large. So the example for pruned branching is that there may be some scenarios where it's uncertainty is not possible. So this might be, there's a rule that items or something must be present before anything else can happen. So if the items are not present or unknown, the model cannot proceed. So it's basically the model is not doing anything. It could be the same as not, not present. So as I said before, in, introduce sets each prune branch to a variable. So in, instead of like individual agent decision. So as I gave the example before, defect rate for the defect rate, uh, there can be multiple agents with like an interval for the defect rate, but it all only feeds into the extra branch. So more agents that have multiple, defect rates, they'll all still only feed into one branch and have multiple branches for each agent. So we've reduced the number of branches. I'll try and illustrate this with a, like a more visible example. So as you can see here, we produce some item. It, we then have a decision where it checks for a defect. And if there's no defect, it carries on into further on into the model. But if there's a defect, it's just dumped. So if there's no resource, there's no work. With the prune branching, we introduce this new branch, which is basically a copy of the original model, but it has like relaxed rules. So if there's a defect, uh, it, it's dumped. If it's not sure, it just goes into the same station, but in the unsure branch. And this uh, the decision-making for the unsure branch is more relaxed, as I said, is that it allows for no defect and unsure and treats them the same. So you still, at the end, you'll still have your certain items or something produced, and then you'll have the extra not sure. 
So the advantages of this approach is that there could be possible time saving as there's less iterations or the disadvantage is the setup time may exceed any of the top computational time saved. So here I've shown like the time it takes for, for 100 repetitions, 1,000 repetitions, and compared it to Monte Carlo and Systematic. As you can see, for 100 repetitions in the interval, we only take a minute compared to a Systematic approach or even Monte Carlo, so we save time. And the range is similar to the Monte Carlo and Mon systematic, but th there is a bit of creep, as you can see in the upper values, and that's due to implementation problems, which we'll go on to later. So here I compare the interval results for 100 repetitions and 1,000 repetitions. As you can see, they have a similar well, structure, I would say like there's two peaks with one real peak and another one quite close, 17 and 18, and the shape hasn't really changed with more repetitions. And now we'll compare that to like Monte Carlo systematic. As you can see, the interval here is different compared to systematic and Monte Carlo, and Monte Carlo and systematic have the same, well, I'll say shape. But going back to the limitation, so this only works for the prune branching only works for items produced. So it doesn't actually work for the agents themselves and doesn't handle any time uncertainty. So it can't handle any like uncertainty on resource inflow, any delays. And the second part is that the uncertain parts can only work with uncertain parts. So if you have many uncertain parts that you've got further into the model, they'll all be shunted into like the relaxed branch and they'll all stay there. So you won't, won't really have many certain stuff. But the problem with that is that if there's many uncertain parts, but there's also lots of certain parts, the two branches will work in parallel. And so they'll efficiently double the throughputs, which as I shown before shows a higher um, upper value for the possible number of items. We may also be doubling inventory space as the certain storage is like separate from the uncertain. For the next example, we go back to propagating um, uncertainty through inside the model, not just branching it. So the example I'll use to explain is the children's battleships game. And we'll use it to demonstrate that it's possible to propagate uncertainty inside an ABM, not just outside it. So I'll start off with describing the scenarios when the ships have uncertain radar ranges. So I'll introduce like the modeling like background behind us. So each ship has a certain range, which I've indicated as a solid black line and an uncertain radar range, which is indicated with a dash line. Ships are located inside the range and radar conditions create uncertainty for both ship and external observers. And analyst is one of the external observers. So now we go on to like the views of the model. So if ship A thinks it sees ship B, because it's the ship B is located in its uncertain radar range, it can fire the missiles and it cannot fire the missiles at the same time. So ships A missile counts will update to both firing the missiles and not firing them, which can be represented as an interval. And since the missiles are fired in uncertain range, the missiles themselves must be uncertain for the interval implementation to correctly work. From the viewpoint of ship B, if ship A exists, and has fired missiles, it can be hit by missiles and all the missiles may miss. So the hit count from ship B will be reflected with like previous number of hits and new missiles have been hit or it's unchanged if the ship, all the missiles have missed. If ship A doesn't exist though, ship B cannot be hit by any missiles because ship A doesn't exist. So ship B is that. 
So this means that the ship hit count is unchanged. And since it's unchanged, we still get the same intervals as if ship A did exist. Ship B's existence depends on the certain hits. And since the missile is fired is uncertain, it, it cannot be sunk. And also if ship A exists as a search, ship B cannot be sunk because if ship A exists, well, ship A can, ship B can be sunk by ship A if it's certainly sunk. Now we show like the scenario too, where the missiles are basically all both in the certain radar range. And we're trying to illustrate the existence of the ships, how it affects it. So if ship A exists, it'll fire the missiles. If ship A does not exist, it will not fire the missiles, which will make the same missile count as before. If ship B, and the same is true for ship B, so if ship B exists, it'll fire the missiles. If it doesn't exist, it won't fire the missiles, and it'll missile count will update to reflect that. And from these five missiles, like if ship B exists, uh, it'll be hit by the missiles. If ship B does not exist, it won't be hit by missiles. So this will be reflected by the sort of change in the hit count. Same is true for ship A's existence. It's all if ship B exists, ship A exists, ship B hit counts will update to represent number of hits. And if it doesn't exist, it won't be hit. So it'll also can be summarized as the interval below. Well, so in summary, while ship B's existence is unknown, ship A cannot be sunk. And the same is true for the other way. So if ship A's existence is unknown, ship B cannot be sunk. So the model then is we've created 60 ships. They move randomly on the canvas and we record the number of ships left. The color represents the state of the ship. So a blue ship could be on full health, a red ship could be one hit away from dying, and an orange ship could be two hits or more. And for Monte Carlo, the radar range, since we're comparing the interval implementation to like the existing Monte Carlo thing, we the radar range is generated from uniform distribution with a minimum as a certain radar range and the maximum as large as possible. So I've run the simulation and I've compared this to the Intel implementation to Monte Carlo. And if we have its controls all in all randomness, we show that the Intel implementation encapsulates the results from the Monte Carlo results. But since um, we use um, random generators, they may like offset everything to show that it's this inter implementation isn't due to the random generators themselves. I ran the same thing with a preset path so the ships don't deviate. If they're sunk, they still had the predetermined sunk path. But if they're not sunk, they'll carry on. And I've removed all the un all the other random generators. And as you can see, the ships still encapsulate the Monte Carlo results. And then I tested it with random, introducing random uncertainty. So like here it was like all paths were random. Here it's just the paths are all random where all missiles are fired that are hit. As you can see, they have the same. Uh, but here the same preset path, but missiles are binomial hit. As you can see, they've increased the number of ships that can survive. We still, sh it still shows that the interval ships like it, it encompasses the Monte Carlo. But one of the questions that arise is, are they the same ship surviving or not? So since each ship had an ID, we collated the ones that survived. And as you can, I've highlighted the ones in red, the ones that are shared. As you can see, apart from two ship IDs, the interval has all, shares all its IDs with Monte Carlo. And even then, even with more Monte Carlo runs, that even they may be included. So to summarize the battleships example, 
that we've shown there is possible to propagate epsom concertity in an ABM. But it does require more thought to do it inside the ABM instead of with Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo can be described as more of a plug and play. But we've also demonstrated that even though the results are differ, it's hard to say which ones are correct as it's a similar trend, similar range. But overall, the conclusion is shown that it is possible. There's no universal solution, but Monte Carlo can be argued as a universal solution. And the results difference from Monte Carlo can be, as the interval implementation can be more inclusive, they have the more of the extreme values than the Monte Carlo. And there are it's their own problems. So for example, supply chain, we use double throughput. So if we just have each implementation, there's no good way of doing it. So in summary, like Monte Carlo is poor finding extreme outcomes compared to other methods that can do it. So I included the KFC as an example of maybe we should be thinking about how to include epistem uncertainty in other things. So I'll try and go through this quite quickly. So a KFC decided to change partner, delivery partner. And on the first day of its contract, the DHL failed to deliver. One of its reasons is that DHL has one warehouse while Bidvest had six. And the car crash happened on junction, between junction two and three on the M6 followed by collision at junction one. And all these junctions are in the vicinity of DHL's warehouse. So that meant the lorries were stuck as soon as they got underway. And then the chicken shorts just happened. But the three, um, three junctions being all closed is quite a rare occurrence. So it's one of the extremes. And if they didn't think about it, um, it shows, illustrates that may, we need to really think about the extremes more than the averages. So KFC handled this as his marketing team has been praised for handling the crisis, especially his humor and tweets and advertisements. So this is just one example of one of them. And they changed the KFC round to that when they had the chicken shortage. And how they solved it is they had a new... New introduce a new contract and basically spread its supplies around to reduce strain on the DHL warehouse. So, are there any questions? Thank you very much for your talk, Vladimir. Um, yeah, really, really interesting. Does anyone have any questions in the audience? Um, yeah, so you touched on the, the KFC crisis yeah. um, briefly, but I'm just wondering how much of a difference if they were using your modeling techniques, would, would that crisis have been completely mitigated or? Um, since I'm mostly highlighting that um, the current techniques we have for like Monte Carlo in ABMs is, is good for getting the averages or like it, they or it, it, the trends more or less say so trends trends this since this and what i'm trying to say is that well it's kind of unlikely that all those three junctions were would be out of like would be slowed down at the same time i'm saying that if they considered the extremes more they may it may have all been mitigated at the start Right. All right. Thank you very much. Could Do you have any other questions? Could you quantify that? I mean, I know that that's the question you were worrying about being asked <laughs> and, and therefore didn't want to even mention the KFC. But in fact, it's a it's a really great question because um, the, the real one is... I'm not the only one. So there's some like professors, I can't remember which university, which they said that there's 
there's basically no mitigation strategies or anything at all. Well, that can't be true. You, they, they could have No, no, no there actually was basically saying they didn't think of what would happen if something happened. Oh, you, oh, you mean that... Yeah, which is why they were scrambling and it basically says the marketing team was praised for the handling. Which and was, why there was so much like advertising and stuff like that. Right. Because they knew the problem and they couldn't solve it quick enough. So like they didn't have any mitigation strategy. But the question for you is how how much mitigation could you have expected using a strategy that would recognize epistemic uncertainty in the in the planning? So that there wasn't any is just reason to, to argue that there should be, but but you need more than that. You need also to find out whether it would have made a big enough difference to pay for itself. Um, I think it's kind of like one of those is how do you call it? Um, you really don't plan for the extremes, but you're aware they can happen. So it's like one of the extremes is both tires on your car blow out. You know it can happen, but you don't really, you can't really plan for it that much. But you should be aware of it. Well, I mean, if- I. So basically, I think the ones I read were saying basically the KFC didn't have any of its awareness that it can happen at all as well. Okay. So you don't really, like, I, I don't know, in life, in life, you know that some stuff can happen that are unexpected. You don't plan for them. But you have a basic idea of what you'll do if something was to happen that way. So should KFC have done something different? Well, since I only included this as a short hand, <laughs> uh, I, they, as you see, they engaged, like, they hired new warehouse and stuff like that. And we went back to Bidvest. My thoughts would be to have a changeover period instead of, yeah, we need to go from like this this partner to that partner so if they had a changeover period they might have just basically had no disruption to the service and and if they had done some analysis in advance would they have recognized that option as a better one uh, it's it's kind of hard to say because there's a um, what i'm saying is basically paraphrasing all the sources i haven't got on these slides yeah and they basically said, well, KFC just made a massive thing of, we're switching, there's the date, here it is, that's it. They didn't, th- so the main problem it shouldn't be is because um, DHL has its warehouse located in, um, I think it was called like the golden rectangle or something where every, from everything from that area can go to any place in the UK under 24 hours. So it means that everything is reachable. But what they didn't account for is what if like the roads right by the warehouse are all clogged, so there's delays because of that. Yes. Yeah, and very, very having good. all the what I said here, like the junction two, three, and one all closed or delayed, meant that they couldn't really get out the warehouse in the first place to start delivering. But it's very unlikely to have all like the junctions all closed at the same time. Um, so, I have a follow up question, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. What other case studies do you think you could incorporate, um, or examples where you think things are more pivotal in kind of the supply chain? Because obviously, if if people don't get their chicken from KFC, it's not the end of the world. But well, speak there... to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I but, didn't include um... the tweet to the police about. The... <laughs> but I'm sure there's like supply chain logistic issues around like the vaccine as well. Would would your agent based modelling kind of help with that sort of issue? Um, the only other case study I've really like looked into was the COVID one. And that's mostly linked to supermarkets. What? 
No, yeah, so the, not, the COVID with the supermarket when we had empty shelves during COVID at the start. Oh, oh, oh. so not the vaccine, but rather no, no, no. things. He's talking about the toilet roll, I think. Right. Yeah. So <laughs> basically, the I found the basically what happened was there was unexpected demand, but it kind of was expected if you think about it. As they during the like the I don't think they can. There's um. Can I stop sharing? Yeah, sure. I, I'll try and find. A, there's um, a government paper about the demand, and it basically shows a massive spike when lockdown happened on grocery shopping. But if you remember, all the restaurants and stuff like that were closed down. So if they were closed down, you'd expect the demand to rise anyway in the supermarket shelf. So it wasn't unexpected. So it's, 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 it's kind of the same as the KFC example of like poor planning. Okay. If people can't go for like lunch in the restaurant they used to, they'll have to buy a home. Yeah. So you should expect for a higher demand than that. Right. And if they had anticipated that higher demand, they would have been able to yeah, they should have had everything the consequences. More. Do you think? Because I think people like... were overstocking. I don't think the supermarket could have necessarily avoided that. Could they? Well, they could. They did. I mean, I wasn't allowed to buy a third can of salmon. Uh, in, in sure, that was perspective. I guess they could have put that in earlier. Yeah. But no one anticipated how much people were going to be over overstocking. That wasn't because the restaurants were closed that people were overstocking. No, there was, if you think about it. So if you have all, if you're used to having lunch at restaurants or buying out or whatever for right. lunch, that's one meal of the day five times. But if right. you have to stay home, it means you have to feed yourself five times. So you, if everyone does it, that's like one extra packet of chicken or something you have to buy for lunch or whatever. Right. But they were buying more than that, right? I thought. Well, that depends. Like if, there's, if they have children, they also have the in school canteens. Yeah. And if they, I can't remember what it was because um, if they had children also have to stay at home. Okay. That's also. Yeah. Yeah. This also depends on people. So some people may have to be more shielded. So they may be like, oh, I can't go to the shop as often. I have to get more. So yeah. it's like, it's one of those where it's poor planning. And they only, like, from what I can remember, they only recovered. Like most of us, they allow the governments allow cooperation between shops. Okay. Or delivery and stuff. So, are, the, are there any exa other examples that you're going to be including in your um, kind of thesis? Not, not really. Most of this stuff was like linked to COVID and stuff, and that's just basically saying, with like all the lockdowns and stuff, it's hard to predict demand. And one of them was like a roof supply or something. Yeah. And they said, we can't predict demand, so we don't know how much stuff to make. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, thank you very much. Yeah, so that's basically most of the thing of if they fail to like predict demand or anything, it just goes. Okay. Have we got any more questions from the audience at all? And if not, let's thank our studio again. Thank you very much, Vladimir. Um, yeah, looking forward to, to uploading this onto your to our YouTube channel. Um, is there anywhere that people can find out more about your research and, and follow your work? Uh, no, I'm not present on any. But he does have okay. meetings at the KFC. So. Hmm? <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. And um, see you all next week. Thanks. Thanks.